good morning. It is so good to see you in the Lord's house today. I want you to take your Bibles, if you have a copy of God's Word, and I want you to turn with me to the Gospel of Luke chapter 22. We're going to be looking at verses 1 through 23 today. And today as we consider the final hours of Jesus on earth for the next several weeks, we're going to conclude uh, this series that I've been in for nearly three years on the Gospel of Luke. And we're going to consider the last hours of Jesus on earth. And today I want to talk to you about the Last Supper. And we see that uh, laid out for us in Luke chapter 22, verses 1 through 23. There was a news story this week. You may have seen it on Sunday, a Friday, uh, excuse me, at sundown on Friday of last week, there was an installation that stretched across the entire plaza outside of the Tel Aviv Museum of Art in Israel. It was a table for 200 people, and it was pristinely set for the traditional Jewish Sabbath meal, the Shabbat. And yet each place setting at this table was conspicuously empty. 200 table settings at this long, 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 long table, every one of them empty. There were high chairs at a handful of the seats. There were children's cups at other settings. And then there were white roses alongside some of the plates. And it made the symbolism of that empty table painfully clear. The table was set for over 200 hostages that Hamas is holding in Gaza. And there were similar Sabbath tables that were set up in the Jewish quarter in Rome and on Australia's famous Bondi Beach. Each one of those tables is a table with a message. Today I wanna talk to you about a table with a message. Consider a Thursday night over 2,000 years ago in the city of Jerusalem. And Jesus and his disciples have gathered for what we often call the Last Supper. It was a Passover meal. Less than 12 hours later, Jesus would be nailed to a cross and he would hang there and die and with his blood and with his body pay for the sin of all of the world, including your sin and my sin. And Jesus understood the significance of these last moments at this table with his closest friends. I want you to think with me about what we see as Luke invites us into that upper room and then calls us to gather around that table with Jesus and the 12. It's a table with a message. It's a table with a message about who Jesus is and his death and his deliverance that he brings to us. And so I want us to stand together as we read verses 7 through 14 of Luke chapter 22. We'll, we'll look at uh, the first 23 verses as we move along and, and we'll look at every one of those verses this morning. But I want us to begin by reading verses 7 through 14. And there the Bible says this, Then came the day of unleavened bread, on which the Passover lamb had to be sacrificed. So Jesus sent Peter and John saying, go and prepare the Passover for us that we may eat it. They said to him, where will you have us prepare it? He said to them, behold, when you have entered the city, a man carrying a jar of water will meet you. Follow him into the house that he enters and tell the master of the house, the teacher says to you, where is the guest room where I may eat the Passover with my disciples? And he will show you a large upper room furnished. Prepare it there. And they went and found it just as he had told them, and they prepared the Passover. And when the hour came, he reclined at table, and the apostles with him. This is the word of God. Will you join with me as we pray? Lord, we love you. We praise you. I thank you for this day that you've given us. And Lord, I, I thank you that you invite us to come and in our hearts and minds gather around that table and to think about who you are, to think about your great love for us, and the price you paid that we might be delivered from our sin. Lord, I pray in these moments that you would move me out of the way, and God, speak a word to your people in this place today, and we'll give you glory and honor and praise for all that you do, for we pray these things in Jesus' precious name. And church, if you agree with that prayer, will you say amen? Amen. You may be seated. Most of the time when I would preach from a passage like this, it would be on, on a day that our church is celebrating 
the Lord's Supper. We're not celebrating the Lord's Supper today. We're going to celebrate the Lord's Supper on the Sunday before Thanksgiving, and I look forward to that. But I, I'm also glad to be able to take some time and really some extra time to look at this entire text and to focus on everything that happened at the Last Supper. Because as we gather around this table, we can discover two simultaneous plans at work. There was a plan that Satan was working in the upper room, and then there was a plan that God the Father and God the Holy Spirit and God the Son, Jesus Christ, were working. So I want you to think about those two plans that we see at work around this table. First of all, we see the satanic plan for our destruction. The satanic plan for our destruction. And it's important to understand that there were those who were plotting and scheming for Jesus' destruction as he came to that table with his disciples. Now, the events recorded in this passage occurred on Wednesday and Thursday before the Friday when Jesus died. And the only event that we know that took place on Wednesday was one singular event, and that was Judas' work to betray Jesus. Look in the first three verses of this chapter, in verses 1 through 3 of Luke 22. The Bible says, Now the feast of unleavened bread drew near, which is called the Passover. And the chief priest and the scribes were seeking how to put Jesus to death, for they feared the people. Then Satan entered into Judas, called Iscariot, who was of the number of the twelve. The Bible says that it was the time of the feast of the unleavened bread and the Passover. The Passover and the feast of the unleavened bread were two remembrances that had become one major event in the life of the Jewish people. Passover marked the night that the Israelites were rescued from Egypt as God had passed over homes that were marked by the blood of the lamb. In the unmarked homes, the Bible says that the firstborn sons died. In the homes that were marked, the death angel passed over and spared those homes. And so that was Passover. And then following that was the Feast of the Unleavened Bread. The Feast of the Unleavened Bread remembered how the Israelites escaped from Egypt and they escaped so quickly, they had to leave so quickly that there was no time for them to allow their bread to rise And so they had baked their bread without leaven. And so these were eight days, first the Passover, and then seven days after it, the Feast of the Unleavened Bread. It became one celebration, and the Jewish people often just called it the Passover. It was a holy time in the life of the people of Israel. But some of the religious leaders, the chief priests and the scribes, were doing something deeply unholy in these days. They were looking for a way to kill Jesus without causing a riot among the Jewish people because Jesus had been increasing and increasing in his popularity. And so Satan himself did something to help these wicked men who were plotting against Jesus. The Bible says that Satan entered Judas Iscariot and moved him to betray the Lord Jesus. Scripture is clear that Judas was energized by Satan as he betrayed Jesus. In John chapter 13, verse 2, the Bible says, During supper, when the devil had already put it into the heart of Judas Iscariot, Simon's son, to betray Jesus. Down in verse 27 of that same chapter, then after Judas had taken the morsel, Satan entered him. And so Satan was working. He put the idea in Judas's mind. He even entered him. The the word that the Bible uses in verse 3 to talk about Satan entering Judas is a word that the Bible uses to talk about demonic possession in other places. And so Satan entered Judas, but Satan's part in the betrayal doesn't take an ounce of guilt away from Judas. Judas made his own choice. Satan's work to destroy Jesus was something he did through a willing cooperative person named Judas Iscariot. Yet Satan's work to destroy Jesus is consistent with how the devil had been working throughout Jesus' ministry 
to destroy him. Satan was always working. He was always fighting against Jesus. And you can see that portrayed in the Gospel of Luke as you move through it. At the beginning of Jesus' ministry, we see a satanic plan to disqualify Jesus. Satan wanted to disqualify Jesus and to to make him unable to pay the price for our sin by tempting him to sin. In John chapter 4, verses 1 and 2, the Bible says, Jesus, full of the Holy Spirit, returned from the Jordan and was led by the Spirit in the wilderness for 40 days, being tempted by the devil. In his twisted mind, Satan reasoned that if he could tempt the Lord to sin, then Jesus would become disqualified. He would be unable to make atonement for your sin and my sin. And so he tempted Jesus, and yet with every temptation, Jesus conquered Satan through the word of God. And so the Bible says in Luke chapter 4, verse 13, and when the devil had ended every temptation, he departed from Jesus until an opportune time. He tempted him in every way he could, trying to disqualify him, and Jesus defeated him with the word of God. It's a reminder to us When Satan tempts us, the way we defeat him is by knowing and obeying the word of God. That's why the Bible says, your word I have hidden in my heart that I might not what? Sin against you. And so we we hide God's word in our heart. We treasure God's word. We seek to obey it. It empowers us to resist the temptation of Satan to sin. And so he tried to disqualify Jesus, but then throughout Jesus' ministry, we can see a satanic plan to discredit Jesus. And we see that in how Satan used the Lord's opponents, whether that was the self-righteous Pharisees or the secular sellout Sadducees or whether it was the religious scribes or, or the corrupt priests. They were continually testing Jesus and trying to discredit Jesus by attributing his miracles to demonic powers. In Luke chapter 11, verses 15 and 16, the Bible says, but some of them said, he cast out demons by Beelzebul, the prince of demons, while others to test him kept seeking from him a sign from heaven. Over and over again, they tried to test him, they tried to discredit him, but over and over again, Jesus passed every test. And he showed his opponents that his power and his authority could only come from God. That was going on throughout his ministry. Satan was attacking and attacking and attacking Jesus. And so at the end of Jesus' ministry, we see a satanic plan to destroy Jesus. And that plan came through the action of Judas, one of the 12 disciples who had spent three years with Jesus. He had heard him teach and he had watched him do miracles and he had gone out preaching in his name. And yet now now Judas was willing to betray him. Look in verses four through six of Luke chapter 22. The Bible says, Judas went away and conferred with the chief priests and officers how he might betray Jesus to them. And they were glad and agreed to give him money. So he consented and sought an opportunity to to betray him to them in the absence of a crowd. He said, all right, you give me the right money. And Matthew's gospel tells us how much he he asked to be given. He He asked for 30 pieces of silver. It was the price of a slave. He said, you give me the right amount of money and I'll find the right place. Nobody will be around. There's not gonna be a riot. People are gonna get mad. You'll be safe. I'll deliver him to you and you can do what you want to with him. He chose to betray Jesus, and Judas became one of the worst villains in all of history. His name has become synonymous with treachery and betrayal and untrustworthiness. There have been some modern interpreters who have tried to psychoanalyze Judas and try to figure out, well, he was trying to do this or trying to do this. They tried to figure out what his motivation was for betraying Jesus. Scripture gives us two motives and anything else is speculation. Two motives. Here were Judas's two motives according to scripture. Number one, he was greedy for money. Number two, he was possessed by the devil. He was greedy for money and he was influenced by Satan. He was possessed by Satan. And whatever Judas may have believed he would accomplish by betraying Jesus, Satan wickedly and proudly imagined 
that killing Jesus would destroy God's plan because that's what Satan wants to do. He wants to destroy God's plan. In John chapter 10, verse 10, Jesus describes Satan's intentions and his actions this way. He said this, he calls him the thief. He calls Satan the thief and he says this, the thief comes only to steal and kill and destroy. That's what Satan does. He promises all kinds of things, but his intentions are always the same. He comes to steal, to kill, and to destroy. That's why he comes into a church. That's why he comes into a family. That's why he comes into a life. He comes to steal, kill, and destroy. Not long ago, I watched a YouTube video of the demolition of a classroom building at the university where Michelle and I went to school, where we graduated. And I watched a wrecking ball just slam against that building over and over until that wrecking ball took the building down. And I have to tell you, I had mixed emotions as I watched that wrecking ball hit that building. Because I sort of have mixed emotions about that building. I spent a lot of time in that building. My English classes were in that building, literature classes in that building. I took some hard tests in that building. I had journalism classes in that building, Spanish class in that building. Did I take Spanish? Yes, I took two years of first year Spanish. And so I took Spanish in, in, that, in that building. I had mixed emotions. I had some good memories of that building, but it was an ugly building. Here's the thing though. As I watched that wrecking ball pummel that building, I realized that this, that's the only thing a wrecking ball can do. The only thing it can do is destroy. You can't build a house with a wrecking ball. You can't cook a meal with a wrecking ball. A wrecking ball won't plant a tree. It does one thing. It destroys. It is incapable of doing anything other than destroying. Satan is like a spiritual wrecking ball. The only thing he comes to do, Jesus says, is to steal, kill, and destroy. Satan and sin will not give you joy and peace. Satan will steal your joy and peace. Satan and sin will not give you life. Satan will snuff out your life. He kills. Satan and sin will not enhance your marriage, not enhance your emotional state, not enhance your family. Satan will destroy your family and you. He is like a wrecking ball. You say, Pastor, why are you making such a big deal about this? We know these things about Satan. I don't think we do because we keep coming back to him. We keep coming back to sin thinking that we're going to get some payoff from it. And Jesus has already said the only thing Satan comes to do is steal and kill and destroy. He only destroys. He only demolishes. So Judas came to the table for the Last Supper possessed by a satanic plan. And it was a plan that Satan thought would result in the destruction of Jesus. He thought, I'm going to have him betrayed and they're going to kill him. They're going to destroy him. And he thought the destruction of Jesus would also be the destruction of any hope we might ever have to be forgiven of our sin and made right with God to escape hell and to gain heaven. That's what Satan thought. Can I tell you something today? Satan was wrong and he's still wrong. In fact, God It's an amazing thing. God sort of did a spiritual judo with with Satan. He used his own momentum against him. And the very thing Satan thought would destroy our salvation is the thing that God used to bring our salvation. Praise God for what Jesus Christ did. So we see the satanic plan for our destruction at the table, but we also see the Savior's plan for our deliverance at that table. Jesus came to deliver people from Satan's destruction. He came to deliver people from eternity in hell. And as we look at the rest of the verses in this passage, we notice some aspects of his deliverance. First of all, it's a deliverance prefigured in the Passover. It's a deliverance prefigured in the Passover. Look again at the command that the Lord Jesus gave to Peter and John in verse eight of the text. Look again in verse eight. The Bible says, Jesus sent Peter and John saying, go and prepare the Passover for us that we may 
eat it. He said, go and prepare the Passover for us. The Passover was a family meal. You ate it with your family. Only a household could eat it. It was legally required that you eat it in the city of Jerusalem and that you eat it together with your family family. And you had to eat the whole animal, the whole Passover lamb. Sometimes they used a lamb, sometimes they would use a goat. But that whole roasted animal had to be consumed by that family at one sitting. And so usually you want to have a a group of about 10 people at least to eat that. And so it was a family meal. But rabbis such as Jesus could serve in the place of the father of the family and his students such as the disciples could be in the place of the children of the family, and they could gather together in a household setting and enjoy that meal together. Jews came from all over the Roman Empire to Jerusalem in those days for Passover. There were up to 200,000 people or more who would come into the city for the celebration. And the Passover lambs and goats were slain in the temple between 2.30 and 5.30 p.m. on Thursday, just before the meal itself. In order to to, to slaughter all of those animals in that short period of time, there was a huge group of priests, 24 divisions, who arrived at the temple early for work. And so when Jesus said, go and prepare the Passover, Peter and John knew what that meant. That meant that they would have carried a lamb to the temple. They would have given it to the priest who slaughtered the animal and caught its blood in bowls and sacrificed uh, the blood on the altar in the temple. And then the two disciples would have taken the the animal's carcass to roast it. And they would have prepared the herbs and the wine and the unleavened bread for the evening meal. As Peter and John came into the city, they discovered that Jesus had prearranged everything for them ahead of time. Just as the Lord had told them, they met a man carrying a jar of water. That was unusual. It was a very unusual thing since only women would carry water. A water in jars in those days. Men usually carried water in skins, but they saw a man carrying a, a, a jar of water, and they knew this was the man that the Lord had prearranged for them to meet. And then the man led them to a home where they said certain phrases. Notice in the text, there were certain things they were to say. And Jesus says, you say this and he'll do this. It was like they had passwords for security because Jesus knew that his life was in danger and his disciples' lives were in danger and he wanted to enjoy that meal with them. And so they found their way to the house and then inside the house on the second floor, there was a room furnished with couches on the floor forming a V-shape, and that was the upper room in Jerusalem. I I visited the traditional site for that room many times. That upper room that Peter and John went to for the first time that day would become a type of headquarters for the disciples in the days to come following the death of Jesus. Look in verses 14 through 16 of Luke chapter 22. The Bible says, And when the hour came, Jesus reclined at table and the apostles with him. And he said to them, I have earnestly desired to eat this Passover with you before I suffer. For I tell you, I will not eat it until it is fulfilled in the kingdom of God. Notice the words of the Lord Jesus in verse 15. He says, I have earnestly desired to eat this Passover with you before I suffer. His language was very, very strong in the Greek text. The the phrase, I earnestly desire is a Hebrew expression where he said, with desire, I have desired. He used the word desire two times just to show how strong his desire was. It expresses his deep, deep desire to share this Passover and its implications with his disciples. Why? Why was Jesus so desirous of sharing this meal with them? Well, one reason is because it would be the last time that he would share a meal like this with his disciples. But even more deeply, He desired to share this meal because Passover is a picture that prefigures his work on the cross. Think about this. Just as the lamb was slain at Passover, Jesus, the lamb of God, was slain for your sins. Just as the lamb's blood was applied to the doorpost of the homes of Israel and caused the angel of death to pass over and spare the lives of their firstborn, Jesus the only begotten Son of God, laid down His life to redeem you. And He applied His blood to your heart to spare you 
from judgment for your sin. Just as the Passover bread was unleavened, leaven in the Bible is a picture of sin. Jesus is the unleavened, sinless bread of life broken for you. Just as the Passover meal was shared by families in a household, Jesus brings us into God's family. He makes us part of God's household. Just as the Passover brought the people of Israel out of the slavery and bondage of Egypt, Jesus brings us out of our slavery and bondage to sin. Praise God. He is our Passover lamb. And so Jesus told his disciples that this would be his final celebration of the Passover with them until it finds its fulfillment in the kingdom of God. We see the Passover as as it prefigures our deliverance. But then secondly, our Savior's deliverance is also a deliverance symbolized in the supper. Luke's gospel gives a more extensive description of the Lord's Supper than any other single portion of Scripture. He gives us a greater description than Matthew or Mark do in their gospels, a more lengthy description than Paul does in 1 Corinthians 11. Look in verses 17 through 20 of the text. The Bible says, And Jesus took a cup, and when he had given thanks, he said, Take this and divide it among yourselves. For I tell you that from now on, I will not drink of the fruit of the vine until the kingdom of God comes. And he took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to them saying, this is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And likewise, the cup after they had eaten saying, this cup that is poured out for you is the new covenant in my blood. Now I want you to just look at those verses of scripture for a moment. I want you to notice some things. Notice that Luke gives us some details that other portions of Scripture do not. He speaks not just of one cup, he speaks of two cups, one before the breaking of bread and the other after the breaking of bread. Some people have wondered why that is. And the answer is beautiful. You can see it clearly when you know the full program and all of the elements of the Passover meal. And so I just want to take a moment to walk you through all of the elements of the Passover meal meal. And I want you to look at this text and think about how what Luke describes here corresponds to the whole meal. At the beginning of the meal, there was a blessing of the feast and of the cup, followed by the drinking of the first cup. That's what we see in Luke 22, verse 17. We see Jesus uh, distributing the first cup among his disciples. Then next, food would be brought out. After the food was brought out, the youngest son, one of the disciples, the youngest one of them, would have asked this question. The youngest son would ask why this night was different from other nights. And then the father, and Jesus served as the father in the father position for his disciples at the Lord's Supper. The father would answer the youngest son by retelling the story of the Exodus and how God had brought his people out. And then the family would praise God for his past and future redemption. And as they did, they would sing the words from Psalms 113 through 115. And then after those Psalms, the second cup would be drunk. This is still before the breaking of bread. Luke does not describe this cup. Then next, the, unbra- the unleavened bread would be blessed and broken and distributed and eaten. Because bread was considered a special gift from God, The Jewish people considered it irreverent to cut the bread with a knife. Instead, they tore the bread with their hands, the breaking of the bread. Look in Luke chapter 22, verse 19. As Jesus blessed and broke the bread, he said that his body was like that bread. It was given for us. That means that Jesus' body was given for us in our place for our sins. And Jesus tells us that we are to take of the bread in remembrance of him. Now, when we talk about remembering something, We don't talk about remembering the way the Hebrew people talked about remembering. The Jewish people had a different understanding of remembering. When we talk about remembering, we just say, okay, yeah, I remember that. That happened back then. For them to remember meant to be grabbed by, to be gripped by the thing in the past that they were remembering. Jesus was saying, as he said, do this in remembrance of me. He was saying, don't ever, ever, ever forget the price he paid for you on the cross. Don't ever, ever, ever forget his body 
that was offered up for you and the love he has for you. And so the bread was broken. Then after the bread was broken, the Passover meal would be eaten, including the entire roasted lamb that had been sacrificed at the temple. And then after that, and notice if you look in verse 20 of the text, the Bible says after they had eaten, that that was the third cup. The father would bless the third cup and the family would eat or the family would drink. And notice the, the words that the Lord said as they drank the cup after they had eaten. He said, this cup that is poured out for you is the new covenant in my blood. His blood creates a new covenant. Don't miss that, dear friend. Jesus' death creates a new covenant between sinful people, that's all of us, and holy God. And in the word of God, a covenant is always marked by the shedding of blood. The old covenant, the Old Testament required the shedding of the blood of bulls and goats and lambs and other sacrificial animals. Hundreds of thousands, even millions of animals were sacrificed in the temple under the old covenant, including the Passover lambs slaughtered each year. But the blood of those sacrificial animals could never erase, could never permanently take away the sin of men and women. That's why they had to be repeated and repeated and repeated and repeated. Every sacrifice bore testimony to the inevitability of the next sacrifice and the insufficiency of the last sacrifice. They had to be given over and over and over. There is a river of blood that flows through the old covenant because animal blood cannot take away human sin. That's why God sent his son. He sent his perfect son to shed his blood once and for all to atone forever for your sin, for my sin. The blood of Jesus shed on the cross pays for our sins fully and finally and forever. Praise God for that. In Jeremiah 31, verse 34, God speaks of this new covenant and he says this, I will forgive their iniquity and I will remember their sin no more. That can only happen through the shed blood of Jesus. And that cup after the supper, Jesus said, is the cup of the new covenant in his blood. Next in the Passover meal, the family would again praise the Lord using the words from Psalms 116 to 118. And then at the very end of the meal, there was a fourth cup. There was a fourth cup at the end of the meal. We don't find it in the Lord's Supper, the last supper. We don't see that there. They didn't drink that cup. In fact, if you look in, in, in the other Gospels, in Mark's Gospel, the Bible explicitly says that Jesus shared the cup with his disciples, that third cup, and said, I will not drink again of the fruit of the vine until that day when I drink it new in the kingdom of God. And then it says they sang a hymn, one of those hymns from Psalm 116 through 118. And then it says very explicitly, they went out to the Mount of Olives. The word of God tells us Jesus left out the fourth cup. Why? Why would he do that? Here's what I believe. Take your Bibles and turn with me to the book of Exodus chapter 6. I want you to see this with me. Look in Exodus chapter 6 in your Bibles. Everybody still with me? Say amen if you are real loud. All right, now listen. I'm, I'm getting ready to take you deep. All right, so I want you to stay with me. I'm going to take you deep into something. But remember, I'm a Baptist preacher. If I take you under, I'll always bring you back up. All right, so I'm going to take you deep just for a second. Exodus chapter 6, verses 6 and 7. The words of Exodus 6, 6 and 7 were the words that they would say at the drinking of each cup, each of the four cups, as they were celebrating the Passover meal. And there's a fourfold promise of God, and each promise goes with each one of the four cups. Listen to what God says. He says, I am the Lord, Exodus chapter 6, verse 6. I am the Lord, and I will bring you out from under the burdens of the Egyptians, and I will deliver you from slavery to them. 
And I will redeem you with an outstretched arm and with great acts of judgment. I will take you to be my people and I will be your God. Four promises from God and they went with the four cups. At the first cup of the Passover, they would remember the first promise from God here. I will bring you out. At the second cup, they would remember God's second promise. I will deliver you from bondage. At the third cup, the one that Jesus said represented the new covenant in his blood, they would remember God's promise, I will redeem you. Praise God for that. And then at the fourth cup, they would remember the fourth promise. I will take you as my people and I will be your God. At the Last Supper, according to the biblical accounts, Jesus did not drink that fourth cup. In fact, he said, I'm not going to drink of the fruit of the vine again until I drink it with you new in God's kingdom. And they left the room without drinking it. But one day, friend, one day we will gather around his table in his kingdom and he will drink the cup once again with us and he will fulfill God's promise given way back in Exodus chapter six. I will take you as my people and I will be your God. He said, listen, I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will receive you to myself that where I am, there you may be also. And forever and ever and ever, we will be with him. Hallelujah. Our Savior's deliverance is symbolized in the supper. But then our Savior's deliverance is also a deliverance foreordained by the Father. Look in verses 21 through 23 of our text. This passage concludes with a reminder about Judas and his betrayal. Jesus says, beginning in verse 21, But behold, the hand of him who betrays me is with me on the table. For the Son of Man goes as it has been determined, but woe to that man by whom he is betrayed. And they began to question one another, which of them it could be who was going to do this. Jesus said, the Son of Man goes as it has been determined. In other words, the Son of Man goes as God has ordained it. Jesus reminds us of something here. Judas was not in control, even as he betrayed the Lord. Satan was not in control, even as he worked to destroy the Lord. In the events leading up to his death, God was in absolute control, just as he always has been and always will be. Now, does Judas bear responsibility for his sin? Absolutely, he does. People have argued for centuries about whether or not Judas was to blame for what he did since he was acting out what God had already determined he would do. But the Word of God makes it clear. Jesus makes it clear. Yes, God had a plan. And yes, Judas' betrayal played a part in that plan. But Judas was responsible for his own decisions and his own actions. Judas chose betrayal. But you, will you look again with me in verse 23 of this text because it's very interesting what the Bible says the disciples did. The other disciples began to question one another which of them it could be who was going to do this. They, they legitimately did not know. They thought it could be any of them. You know most of the time when I see paintings of, of the disciples and they show Judas, they always sort of give it away that Judas is going to be the one who betrays Jesus. When I go see uh, plays where they reenact the, 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 the crucifixion of Jesus and his betrayal, that they always give it away as to who Judas is and what he's going to do. He's always sort of in the corner somewhere in dark shadows. He has a scowling look on his face. and He's rubbing his hands together as though he's plotting something. You can sort of tell he's up to something. And yet when the disciples heard Jesus say, my betrayer is with me at the table, they didn't all say, well, it must be Judas. He's always over there in the corner in the shadows with a scowl on his face, rubbing his hands together, looking sinister. They didn't say that. He looked like just all the rest of them. He had done the same thing all the rest of them had. And they all saw 
that they had the potential to betray their Lord. It's a reminder to us, everyone has the potential to reject Jesus, to betray Jesus, to be unfaithful to Jesus. Judas chose betrayal and he faced judgment. And yet God in his perfect grace and mercy, God in his perfect justice and righteousness had determined long before creation that he would sacrifice his precious son to make atonement for sinners like me and like you. The great British preacher Charles Spurgeon told the story about a judge in America who was called upon to try a prisoner. And this prisoner had once been the judge's close friend. The crime was one for which the penalty was a heavy fine. And it was a fine that was so high that the prisoner could not afford to pay it. And yet the judge who knew this prisoner and who had been his friend, the judge did not diminish the fine. In fact, the crime had been so serious that the judge had to fine that prisoner to the fullest extent of the law. Some who knew the judge and knew he had once been friends with the criminal thought that the judge was unkind in his sentence. Others admired his righteousness and his impartiality. But everyone in the courtroom was astounded when after he had announced his sentence, the judge stepped down from the bench and opened up his pocketbook and himself paid every dollar that the prisoner owed. He had shown respect for the law, but he had shown friendship for the man who had broken it. He enacted the penalty He paid for it himself. Friend, that's what God did. That's what God has done through his precious son, Jesus Christ. He has not minimized the seriousness of our sin. He has not ignored the punishment our sin deserves. But through Jesus Christ, God himself has endured the price to pay for our sins. His own son, Jesus, who is God himself, paid the debt for your sin and for my sin when he went to that cross. That's why he said, remember, my body is given for you. Remember, my blood creates the new covenant to bring you to God forever. At the Last Supper, he showed that he would pay the last price for our sin for all of eternity.